Good to be with you today. Last time I stood here, it was 110 degrees outside, at least last year, and uh, what a change. Just delighted to have this gorgeous weather. Preserving faith in a faithless generation. I don't need to spend a lot of time convincing you it's a faithless generation, but a few statistics would be profitable. One I just read on the Barner Research Report is that two-thirds of high school boys now believe that cohabitation is the best and wisest preparation for marriage. That breaks my heart. The media has been mainlining popular culture to our youth like heroin put into the bloodstream. And as a result, our young people are imbibing these values as if they're fact. And Christian young people are not exempt. Over half of evangelical young people in high school now believe that there's far more evidence for evolution than biblical creation. Our corporations are shamelessly marketing for the teen dollar. There's a one billion dollar market. That's the purchasing power of teens in this country. Our corporations have been shameless. They're promoting immodesty, perversion, even group sex in order to get that dollar. Apart from revival, America continues to be willing to be the devil's apprentice as if she's standing in line saying, let us be first in line to be economic Babylon and religious Babylon. Because of these things, I would not be surprised to see headlines in our papers that would read something like this. Churches lose their nonprofit status over hate speech against gays. Several denominations now under investigation for hate speech. Underground churches are now required to register with their state. Homeschooling has been declared illegal. Academies have 12 months to disband. The one-two punch of terrorism and echo disasters on American soil have bankrupted the federal government. Bailout of failing, failing corporations will not take place. Massive layoffs are bringing an avalanche of loan defaults. Martial law is inevitable. The UN has declared America a rogue military state. UN observers will now be placed in Congress. China dumping U.S. investments. Taiwan trembles, expecting imminent invasion. Gangs of homeless have commandeered markets and neighborhoods in 10 U.S. cities, driving out residents into the street. Of course, you're saying, I hope that doesn't happen. Well, I'm saying the same thing, I hope it doesn't happen. But something is going to happen. It's called the day of the Lord. And Christ has warned us of the events which will lead up to the day of the Lord. That men's hearts will fail them for fear as they consider the things that are coming upon the world. I'm wondering if the church is being systematically schooled for suffering. I don't think it is. I don't think the church is ready to suffer. I sat there in my seminary class a few years ago as our instructor opened up that passage about the great falling away. He said, students, the great falling away is not a reference to the secular world. The great falling away is a reference to professing Christianity. You see, God says in Hebrews chapter 12, he's going to shake everything that can be shaken until the only thing left is the kingdom of God. 
Are we ready for that shaking? Will your faith survive that shaking? Any one of these headlines would assault the faith of so many professing Christians. And one of my goals in this message this morning is to give you six areas of faith where I'm guessing the majority of people in this room are not fortified. Six areas of faith that you're probably neglecting. And I'm drawing those from 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4, if you'll turn there with me in your Bibles. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. The Apostle Peter wrote this epistle at a time in which false teachers were taking advantage of the very conditions we see today. Uncertainty, fear, confusion, doubt, and prevalent heresies. So Peter writes this epistle to stabilize his readers and to have them go over again the stones, the foundation stones of their Christian faith that they might be built up and grow in grace. Follow with me in your Bibles as I read 2 Peter 1, 1 through 8. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who've received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. For now, for this very reason, applying all diligence to your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As I was on my knees asking God for a passage when I knew I was going to be preaching on preserving faith, this just kept coming up. In fact, the whole book kept coming up. Because I'm convinced the whole book of 2 Peter is written to preserve faith in a faithless generation. What is chapter 1? But faith against the onslaught of hypocrisy. And what is chapter 2? Faith against the onslaught of sexual immorality. And what is chapter 3? Faith amidst the onslaught of religious scoffers and religious heretics. It's all there. I thought to myself, why preach? Just bid these people to go home and pray Second Peter on their knees. Then they'll preserve their faith. Well, Peter says in verse 1 that he's a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. We are only one of those two. We are bondservants of Jesus Christ. At least the time in which Peter lived, to speak of yourself as a bondservant was very socially demeaning. So for Peter to say this was an act of condescension and humility and an act of recognizing the nobility and supremacy of his master. Every true believer is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. You are God's possession. You live to do his will. When he saved you, you surrendered your right to run a self-directed life. The very first principle, the very first way to preserve faith in a faithless generation is to make it your ambition as a bondservant to please your head, to please Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.9, Paul said, it is, it is my ambition to be pleasing to him. That is a controlling principle in my life. I don't know about you, but I've found that to be the major area of warfare in my life. And I would ask you this, how many times last week did you pray this prayer as you made your decisions? Lord, what would please you in this? What would please you in this? That's nothing less than what it means 
to be a bond servant of Jesus Christ? What would please you, Lord, in this situation? God is conquering us. He's bringing us to a point of surrender for the purpose of usefulness. And being a bond servant is being willing to receive that process. It's Christ's conquering love. It's bringing you to that point of surrender and usefulness. Well, Peter goes on to say that uh, those to whom he's writing, and includes us, have received a faith of the same kind, even the same kind the apostles received. It's the same kind because it's an equal gift based upon the same imputed righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a powerful verse for the deity of Christ. We have a God-approved righteousness. And God in the flesh has woven that robe of righteousness by his life, death, and resurrection. Our proposition, at least my preaching proposition today, besides bolstering your faith with these six principles, my preaching proposition today is this. The faith that God has created in you, he speaks to that faith the promises that he himself has made. He speaks his promises to the faith he has created. That's the Christian life. That's so basic and academic, but that's the Christian life. He speaks his magnificent promises to the faith he's created in his elect. Verse 2 tells us, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Is that your experience? Is that what's happening to you? Is grace and peace being multiplied to you or do you experience a degree of stagnancy? I believe that God wants us to experience that grace and peace. In fact, each time we receive one of his promises by faith and reckon that promise, we know him a little bit better. The knowledge of God is advanced by appropriating the promises. It's not just to keep us out of a ditch and somehow get us through this valley of tears to heaven. The promises are given to advance our knowledge of God. That's how we learn about him. I do not say he's faithful as, as a theoretical proposition. I say he's faithful because I'm launching out on the promises. I'm inching out on this branch called the word of God. I'm leveraged on God. If that branch should break, I fall, but it's unbreakable. Further out I go on that branch, I'm just as safe because I'm leveraged on the promises of God. Well, Paul tells us, I'm sorry, Peter tells us here that this grace and peace is multiplied to us in the knowledge of God. Grace and peace is never given as a commodity separate from knowing God. Sometimes we pray, Lord, give me more peace. I'm just so frustrated. I'm, I'm stuck in a place of guilt and condemnation and even backsliding. Grace and peace is communicated through knowing the Lord. That means to pursue the knowledge of God with all your heart, pressing on to know the Lord as he's revealed in the gospel. This is one of Peter's favorite words, knowledge and knowing the Lord. This is not the same thing as head knowledge. In fact, the Greek word that Peter uses here for knowing is the strengthened word for know, epigonosko. That's a different kind of knowledge than just theoretical knowledge. This particular Greek word means thorough, intimate, exact, complete, working knowledge of God, of Christ. This means the believer knows Christ personally rather than knowing about him. So many believers today have second-hand convictions. I appreciate great preaching. I've got a collection of CDs in my home. I put them on my iPod. I listen to them in my car. I go to conferences. But I'm also aware of this. 
I will never have first-hand convictions if I only gather up the manna other men have gathered. I will never have first-hand convictions if I run my fingers over the gold other men have dug. I will never have first-hand convictions unless I do some of that digging. You see, the faith that God creates is not content with second-hand convictions. The faith that God creates must have first-hand convictions. I want to be conversant with the object of my faith. See, God has planted in you a desire for happiness. That's what it means to be human. I must pursue an object of delight and desire. Therefore, the faith he creates in you is created to be ravished by Christ. You will not be content with second-hand convictions. And so principle number two, if you're going to preserve faith in a faithless generation, get your convictions firsthand. Dig your own treasure. Match your desires with the riches of Christ. Don't be content with second-hand convictions. Don't be con you hear a great sermon? Don't be content. Go dig more. This growth in the knowledge of God is dear to Peter's heart. It's something which, mu which must remain constant and continuous. I advise the gentleman I disciple to keep on their nightstand a book about the Lord Jesus Christ and a book about grace and the gospel and sanctification, books that they're always going through. Keep those on your nightstand with a notepad and a pen. Study the saving work of God towards you with a view to personalizing it. Not just to grasp the concepts, but to personalize it until you can read it and meditate on it doxologically and it comes back out of you as worship. Meditate on the passages that explain how God sees you in Christ. Make it your goal to grow in the knowledge of God. Principle number three, if you're to maintain faith in a faithless generation, you must make the knowledge of God your highest goal. The only thing you will take past the grave is your relational knowledge of God. That's the only thing that's going to survive. Death is your relationship with God. God laid hold of you for this very purpose, that you might press on to know the Lord, that you might answer the upward call, that you might fulfill his calling on your life. Well, verse 3 opens up a whole panorama. It says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us, by his own glory and excellence. This just defies an attempt to explain that God's own glory and excellence have first of all called us into this love relationship with himself. He's imparted a relationship with us that will last forever. And then in joining us to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's given us everything we could possibly need for life and godliness, for life in God, and for godly living. In Christ, there's total sufficiency. You're complete in him. But this is bestowed through a true knowledge of him who called us. God makes himself known to us in the way that he saves us. He makes himself known to us in what is required to pardon us, a substitutionary atonement by God the Son. He makes himself known to us through the mighty deeds of atonement. This knowledge is anything but superficial or casual. It's a knowledge which is intensely practical. For Christ has everything you need for growth, development, perseverance, sanctification, service, resisting temptation, and finishing the Christian life well. Christ has all you need 
for those things. And brethren, it is a breakthrough in your faith. It is reaching a new level of maturity when you understand and realize that Christ's virtues are made available to you as a believer. That's a breakthrough of faith. I found myself praying last night as I wanted this sermon to be so good. I, Lord, this is terrible. This is starting to be about me. I hate this. And so I prayed a, an exchange life prayer. Lord, give me Christ's meekness right now that my goal for ministry might be the exaltation of Christ and the glory of God. You see, we have exchanged lives with Christ. That's a realm that the mature are beginning to penetrate. It just bursts on your understanding that these virtues are freely granted to us by union with Christ. And that exchange began 2,000 years ago when Christ took our place and was, be willing, was willing to be made sin for our sakes that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He began the exchange then. And when we're united with Him, it's a life of exchange. This is so essential to know that these resources we have in Christ are indeed the possession of the believer. It's vital we know this. It, it strengthens us for resolve. It gives us comfort in our setbacks. It produces greater fruitfulness, and it gives us courage and boldness to step out beyond our natural strength. I can't tell you how many Christians I talk to who calculate what they could do for God based upon their own abilities and their own feeble strength. They never make a calculation based upon reckoning the virtues that Christ has available to them, lest they fail, lest they experience the bitterness of defeat, and so they don't take a risk. I teach a class in worldview and evangelism at the Master's College. I have 18 students in this one room, and all of them are Christian ministry majors. And I ask them, would you like to go witnessing with me in the mall next Friday? Eight of them, eight of them came. I was surprised. We sat there in Starbucks, and during an orientation session, I said to them, and these are adults. This is, the, this is the continuing bachelor's degree program. These are adults who already have vocations. They're Christian ministry majors. How many of you have ever shared your faith with a stranger? Three out of the eight. These are Christian ministry majors. I was shocked. I said, well, you're going to get your feet wet today. You came here to watch me witness, and I'm here to coach you, and you're going to do the witnessing. One woman followed me over to a cigar store, and three big guys puffing cigars were willing to listen to her. One was a Homeland Security guy, bomb squad guy, looked like he's built like a Navy SEAL. The second guy was a 300-pound sheriff. The third guy was a very vocal skeptic. And she somehow got through her questions about the gospel. And by the end, these men were actually asking questions. Why are you here? And tell me the real purpose of this. And uh, it was actually a successful time. She found there was strength. She said her heart was practically palpitating all the way over to the mall, knowing she had to do this. But when she stepped out, just like those priests put their big toe in the Jordan, it started to part. There was strength for the witnessing that she didn't know would be there. How many calculations do we make on our own strength and not about the strength that Christ will supply when we take the risk? Well, back to our text. Peter says that this calling, this calling to salvation is by God's own glory and excellence. And as Brother Jim explains so well, this is the big picture. Your salvation, God taking you from defiled dust and slogging clay to glory in heaven is the way he's magnifying his name and educating angels. This is God's plan. He's putting His glory on display by getting the church to heaven. 
You see, when you proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, you are proclaiming that God's attributes were put on display to make you a son or daughter of God. That's what you're proclaiming. It's not just about your testimony. I was this, now I'm this. No, you're proclaiming the excellencies of God who took you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Well, Peter wants us to strive according to the power that is in Christ Jesus. For in him we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. So principle number four, if you would preserve faith in a faithless generation, is this. You must exchange your weakness for Christ's strength. That needs to start entering your prayer life. You must do this consistently, consciously, intentionally, personalize the promises, expect him to deliver on those promises. Preach this to your faith, that in Christ you have everything for life and godliness. See how these promises are designed to stabilize you? This, this puts ballast in your ship. This is concrete in the basement. This is foundational. But you have not appropriated it until you reckon it, reach for it, and then risk. You've not appropriated it until you've done that. Reckon it, reach for it, and then risk. You've not appropriated it until you say, this is death to my excuses for not serving God. This is death to my excuses for living with bosom sins. This is death to my stagnancy and mediocrity. This is death to my unbelief. For I have not believed until I cease calling God a liar when he says, I've given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. Faith is a cessation of unbelief. It's ceasing to call God a liar. I'm convinced that so many professing Christians think that faith is something other than what it is. Faith is active. It's dynamic. It detests a double life. It's vigorous. It's militant against sin. It takes heaven by storm. It works through love. It renounces the flesh. It's eager for Christ's return. It's zealous for good deeds. It's bold for the gospel. It's passionate about the glory of God. It suffers for Christ. What have we accepted in place of that? Well, Peter tells us in verse 4, For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises. And brothers and sisters, the antecedent of the word these is so, so vital. For by his own glory and excellence, from verse 3, he's granted us his magnificent promises. Let this sink in. The specifics of the gospel, every aspect of the gospel, that's designed to pardon you, reconcile you, propitiate God's wrath toward you, every aspect of the gospel is the infinite perfections of God harnessed for your good. Every aspect of the gospel is God putting to work His majesty, His excellence, and His perfections so that you'll find your entire salvation in Him. Sometimes in my worldview class, I ask my students, why is there a universe? I say, well, uh, God's creator. Why do you make the universe? Why is there a universe, a solar system, a planet Earth, and a human history? And the answer is because God has a boundless propensity to share himself. That's why. And what is God sharing himself but the outshining of his, perfect, his perfections, his excellence, and his majesty to the delight of the creature? And what's another word for that? Glory. The universe exists, the solar system exists, planet Earth and human history for the outshining of the perfections of God to the delight of the creature. That's why we're here. If that's not energizing your life and pushing it forward, you're out of touch with reality. That is ultimate reality. Now, God's attributes, His, His glory, His excellence, 
in essence, God took these in his hands and, and like melting them down into a, into a mold in a foundry, he cast the gospel promises from his own attributes and majesty. That means the way in which he saves you puts God's glory on display. This is what Jim was touching on in, in, the, in the overarching meta narrative. The way he saves us and sanctifies us and takes us to glory puts his perfections on display. For out of his excellence come these gospel promises which give shape to your life and life to your lifeless spirit. Oh, this is deep. I know it's deep. But let's look at our text again. Verse 4. Out of these things, he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Those are gospel grace promises. And by means of those gospel promises, second part of verse 4, in order that by them, these magnificent promises, you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. This is such a lofty plan. To become partakers of the divine nature is to have God's moral nature put in you as a creature so that his seed abides in you and you cannot practice sin. It's to be destined to be conformed to the moral image of Jesus Christ so that he's, that he's now at work on you. He's at work on the new man. He's the architect of the new man. He's the creator of the new man. He's the contractor that gets the new man built and he's the template for the new man in which he's being constructed. He is all these things. To have the divine nature put in you is the promise that someday you will share his holiness. God has cast these promises in a foundry, so to speak. They form a mold. The gospel forms a mold for your Christian life. You should be able to feel the sides of that mold and know exactly who you are in this world and how God is preparing you for usefulness and for glory. What a source of resolve this is. That he's, he's imparted to us the divine nature. Past tense, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. See, you have, we have to contemplate ourselves the way God contemplates us. You're an escapee. So am I. You're an escapee. By the sovereign grace of God, you're an escapee. You will never take another sip from that cesspool from which you've escaped. You've been liberated. The divine nature, you're housing the divine nature. You must see yourself the way God defines you here as an escapee from the corruption that's in the world by lust. Therefore, as those who possess the divine nature, the only logical, reasonable response is to renounce the world and give yourself back to God. For there's nothing in this world that your soul can feed on and get an iota of nourishment from because the divine nature resides in you. Therefore, smash your heart idols. Trample all the world's lying offers. Answer the upward call. For the image of God has been reborn in you, and you have been a partaker of the new nature. So out of the six principles for fortifying faith, this is number five. If you would preserve faith, you must regard that gift of the new nature or the divine nature to be the most precious treasure that you now possess. For by it, you will gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 We've been called to a supernatural life. We've seen that knowledge of God is the door to holy living. But it's not a knowledge that's theoretical or abstract or simply assent to a body of facts. It's a working, conversant, epigonosco knowledge 
that has an intimate desire to know more fully, it will not be satisfied with being static. If we are to mature in the faith, we must be willing to see the big picture, that God is putting his glory on display in making a new humanity and constructing this new humanity around the Lord Jesus Christ. That through constructing that new humanity, God is manifesting his perfections and his excellence. If your faith is to go to maturity, you must pass from how am I doing to what is God doing? Is that how you think? What is God doing in the world? You must go beyond how am I doing to what is God doing. The big picture is vital. I find myself desiring to study and meditate and feed on the word of grace that I might cultivate the divine viewpoint, that I might see the big picture, that this is why there is a universe and a solar system and an earth and a human history because God has a boundless propensity to share himself to the delight of the creature. You see, by the promises that God has forged in his foundry, by those promises, he's speaking faith. I'm sorry, he's speaking to the faith he created in you. And are you listening as he's speaking that faith? Are you listening? Faith he created are the lungs. The promises are the breath we take. That's the Christian life. Would you do anything differently in your Christian walk if you actually believed the second person of the Godhead left his throne in order to make you like himself, in order to glorify God, and that in Christ you lack nothing for life and godliness, and that by the gospel promises you cannot fail to go from dust to glory? Would you do anything differently if you really believed that? The sixth and final principle for fortifying faith is this. If you would preserve faith, then meditate on things above for the purpose of gaining the divine viewpoint. That this is what God is doing in the world. This is why there's a universe. Meditate on the word of faith for these purposes. And may I propose a prayer as I close this morning. Lord, raise me out of stagnancy and doubt. Raise me up to that divine viewpoint. Let my faith Feed on your promises that I might understand that you moved heaven and earth to give me infinite resources in Christ. You harnessed your own glory and excellence in order to plant in me the divine nature that I might gain the glory of Christ. And Lord, right now you're speaking to that faith. You're speaking your promises to the faith you created in me. Therefore, I want to know you more and more. I will step out from my timidity upon the infinite resources in Christ in order to do your will. Amen.